and the E. We start uh, our sema seminar today and also the last seminar of our seminar in this year. And um, our speaker is Florio Siglas <coughs> from the University of Madrid. He shall uh, uh, speak on Chardang Algebra, co actual Archibis, and uh, Information Geometry, please. Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation for having me here. Um, I will now proceed to share my screen, hoping that everything goes according to plan. It should be. Can you actually see what's here? Can you make it larger? Please. I will, uh, but it seems like this is the, the biggest thing. Otherwise, I can I can go like this, but you see. OK, 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 then, then not so much here. Yeah? Yes, yes, and you can, yeah. OK, that's uh, that's good. That good. I, I, may, no. so I only see. So I apologize, but I have to close my camera because I have to flip the computer in order to be able to write. So, well, you can no longer look at me. OK. So, uh, as I said, thank you very much for inviting me. It's very nice to be here. Uh, also, because it's quite some time that I don't give a talk, so perhaps I'm a little bit rusty. So, I apologize in advance if I stagger too much or, you know, I, I don't uh, get as I should get. So, uh, you see here today's menu, which is a four course, let's say, intellectual meal, hopefully. Uh, we will start with a little bit of um, background on what parametric models are in classical and quantum information geometry, uh, because the basic of the talk will then be trying to um, argue that there is actually uh, a unifying perspective that brings together the classical and the quantum in terms of Jordan algebras. So the idea would be that parametric models of uh, probability distribution or quantum states can actually be described in the same mathematical framework using Jordan algebras and actually positive linear functional on them. Then we will pass perhaps to the, to the you know, the, the most important course of, of today, which is the um, formulation of Kirillov's theory in the context of Jordan algebras, because when we will review the parametric models, we will see that parametric models are not in information geometry, are not just naked manifolds. They come with some kind of heavy geometry, which in the classical case builds on the space of probability distributions uh, of which the models are just uh, parametrizations. And in the quantum case, they build on, on the space of um, positive operators on the inverse space of the system. Now, this um, geometrical structure that one can obtain in the classical and quantum case, I hope I'll be able to show you that, at least in the finite dimensional case, so that we avoid a lot of te uh, technicalities. But if you are interested in, in the infinite dimensional case, please ask as much as you can. I will definitely not have uh, all the answers, but uh, I will um, be very glad to, to discuss it. Uh, and the idea is that if you re adapt Kirillov's theory of quadjoint orbits, which is um, uh, primarily written in terms of uh, algebras, of Lie algebras, and the action of a Lie group on the dual of its Lie algebra, then what happens is that the Jordan algebras are powerful enough to make you recover the classical fischer geometric tensor and one of the many quantum fischer geometric tensors, uh, precisely um, using Kirillov's theory. And then we will end with some uh, concluding remarks. So let's start with the first part. So classical information geometry, parametric models. What, what are these parametric models? Basically, we are in the situation where we are interested in some kind of uh, positive measure on some outcome space. Now, I will not always impose the condition that, um, sorry, it's not this, I will not often impose the condition that you know the integral of um, our probability distribution so to speak on the omega is one um, sometimes i just work well actually for the most uh, part of this talk we will uh, deal with unnormalized probability distribution so positive measures because it, in some sense you can always recover the normalization condition after 
uh, but if you remove it from the beginning, uh, some things are clearer, so to speak. So the point is that we are somehow interested in this set, but this set is not a manifold, it's not a smooth manifold, uh, not even in finite dimensions. Uh, it's actually a stratified manifold, a manifold with corners in, in the best case scenario. Uh, and thus you cannot use all the tools of differential, of standard, so to speak, differential geometry. That's why uh, you focus on parameters, meaning that basically you don't consider the whole space of measure, but just a subset, which is somehow parameterized by points M in a manifold. Uh, more often than not, uh, it uh, happens that as I was writing here, there is a kind of dominating measure uh, dominating all the, the, the distributions in your model so that you can actually parameterize this uh, distribute probability distribution or unnormalized probability distribution using uh, the radon nicodym derivative with respect to this um, dominating measure. That's not... So oh, sorry, Florio, but yeah. to consider M is a finite or uh, also infinite dimensional manifold. At the moment, M can be even infinite dimensional. In fact, this is very, um, th this is one of uh, the things that I like most about your book on information geometry, where the actual parametric model needs not to be a finite dimensional manifold. Uh, why should we actually yes, confine sir. ourselves to, to this case? There is no need. Uh, and indeed, I actually, I personally don't believe much in the, in the terminology parametric model and non-parametric. I believe they are very misleading. Because, well, if you take an infinite dimensional uh, smooth manifold, in, in what sense can it be parametric? But still, that's kind of semantic. So let's yeah. not dwell too much into it. The point is that um, the very fact that M represents probability distribution or measures here. So the fact that M is not just a naked manifold, but it, its points represent probabilities. Um, allows for the definition of geometrical structure on M. That's kind of surprising. And I think very interesting. Indeed, uh, suppose M is finite dimensional so that we have local coordinates. That's just a simplifying assumptions. In fact, in uh, Fan's book, there is a extensive discussion on how to do this in a perfectly intrinsic fashion without using coordinates. But for the purpose of this introduction, let's, let's stay like here. And well, if you introduce these coordinates, you can define a metric tensor, which is known as the fischer tau metric tensor. Uh, the, and the components, as you can see, are written in terms of the expectation value with respect to the, what, to the um, point uh, you are uh, parameterizing of what? Of the derivative of these functions. Now, this is the rather Nicodian derivative that you find here. And you take it, uh, you take its logarithm. This in statistics usually is called the score function. Uh, so you see that the Fisher metric tensor, which is a tensor defined here on the parametric manifold, is actually defined in terms of objects that are here in this space of measures. So somehow the geometry of M is dictated by things here. I don't want to say geometry because, well, because unfortunately, as I said, um, the, the space of probability distribution or of measures is not a manifold. So there is not a real metric that you can take the pullback off. So it's not um, as geometric as one would like. For instance, oh, oh, sorry. The prototypical example would be this, which is in finite dimension, both from the point of view of omega, because in this case, it's just a discrete space. And from the point of view of the parametric manifold, because this is just uh, so to speak, the, the, the positive orthant of Rn. So point in Rn whose coordinates whose, uh, coordinate with respect to some specific reference Cartesian system are just uh, strictly positive. So you represent a point P in terms of a measure, which is basically a weighted sum of Dirac delta measures. So what you are doing is that basically you are considering the dominating measure mu that I uh, said before to be the counting measure, counting measure on omega. Then if you apply the formula that um, was written before, uh, somehow this is not a very comfortable computation because sometimes the transition from the continuous to the discrete, at least to me, 
bring some kind of uh, unexpected um, weirdness. But if you do it, uh, the result is this, is the component of this uh, metric tensor are of this type so that you can write your tensor like this. Now, if you want to impose the normalization, well, you just, uh, what you're doing, you're imposing this constraint so that your manifold is actually a sub-manifold of this model M, and then you can take the pullback of this metric tensor. This is the fischer metric tensor. And in this specific finite dimensional case, it uh, fulfills a very nice invariance property, which was discovered first by Shentsov. So if you take uh, all, the, all these um, parametric models for N that can be arbitrary, and you, can, and you consider um, the so-called congruent embedding, these are just maps that takes uh, one linear maps, one Rn into Rm, such that the image of this map of what? Of this manifold here is actually here, and it's diffeomorphic to its image. That's really important. Then if you take this class of maps and you ask what, uh, what is the family of metric tensors on this uh, orthants that it's invariant uh, with respect to these maps, then this is the only possibility that you have. Actually, I am cheating a little bit, but I don't want to enter in too much details. We, we can, if you're interested, we can discuss later. So there is this kind of very important connotation of, of fischer metric tensor in this finite dimensional case, which in some sense is also extended to the infinite dimensional case, but then some more assumptions are needed. So this question is clearly more difficult. One second. Okay. Now we pass to the quantum case where the situation is basically analogous. Uh, we have a parametric model. So we have models, a, a manifold of parameters, and we now represent what no longer measures on some outcome space, but quantum states, which are basically positive operators on the Hilbert space of the system. Now you may wonder why I have this picture here also in the in the classical case I had it well I have it because both the space of measure and the space of positive linear functions uh, sorry positive linear operators are a cone that's why I, I drew it like this inside an ambient uh, vector space which is actually a Banach space in the uh, in the in both cases in the classical cases the space of signed measures here would be basically the space of let me say self-adjoint operator, even if this is not completely true. And the fact that we have this ambient space actually helps us in considering this, this map that sends M into, let me call it phi of M, which is rho M. Gloria, so, so M is a CP of A, is, a is, um, how to say? Uh, Complex I projective space. 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 That's the complex projective space. That's complex one of projective space. Yeah, yeah so that's one of the uh, typical. Uh, uh, yeah, OK. Uh, but in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you put it as a C. All right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in general, since we have this vector space here, which is actually a Banach space, we can actually deal with uh, differentiability property of, of this map from M to, uh, sorry, this map phi from M to the overall ambient Banach space. In fact, this is how we introduce some kind of, of smoothness consideration in our setting. That is why I was keen on drawing this, this underlying vector space. Uh, but the idea of the quantum information geometry is basically the same. We have uh, parameters that account for subfamily of in this case quantum states that we are interested in. For instance, there is one particular case in which the manifold, the parameter manifold is the complex projective space. So basically, rays in a Hilbert space. These are equivalence classes of vectors. So psi is in H, and these are equivalence classes with respect to the standard action of non-zero uh, non complex numbers. Now, how can we represent them in terms of positive operators on H? Well, we take the equivalence class associated to psi, and we associate with it this type of operator. 
this is definitely a linear operator and it's also positive as um, it's almost trivial to check what is important now is that on this manifold there is um, a very important metric tensor that can be in fact defined uh, in terms of an invariance property which is very similar to that of the chance of case because this metric which is known as the fubini studi metric tensor is unique on this parameter manifold if we ask for unitary invariance so in this case you no longer have this this class of congruent embedding which relates spaces with different dimension you have a family of maps which which says inside let's say your, your parameter space and it's given by an action of group so it is to some extent even nicer but unfortunately this is where things completely diverge between the classical and quantum case because this uniqueness of the uh, fubini studi metric tensor is definitely oh sorry not share what is happening from it's not shared by the prototypical example that we will consider which is the quantum counterpart of the or thumb that we saw um, before. This is basically the space of what? Of strictly positive uh, linear operators. So these are uh, operator in, on, on the Uber space of the system, which are strictly positive, meaning that the spectrum is basically contained in R plus. Zero is not contained there. Very good. Uh, um, now, Florio, I, I did not understand what, uh, what you mean that not unique in the counterpart of the around metric in general because you have this, this made uh, 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 what, what do you mean that's a, that an, uh... so the the Fisher metric tensor fulfills a kind of uh, uniqueness yes um, in the classical case in the but quantum unique, case uh, invariant under how to say sufficient static or some kind yeah, yeah, of yeah. That, that's our uh, congruent embeddings are pre precisely the sufficient statistic yes and but here you also pose some such kind of invariant condition and the that there of... is yeah yeah that's that's the point i want to to go to uh, okay it's that, um if you have this model so you have these positive operators now a tangent vector you can basically identify it within self-adjoint element by means of this uh simple uh, computation the point is that here you have a kind of metric tensor which is known as the burel strom metric tensor that you see here is defined in this way and it requires the inverse of these operators which is basically the anti-commutator uh, this uh, metric tensor was actually defined trying to extend uh, estimation theory to the quantum case so just like fischer rao metric tensor has a lot to say in respect to estimation theory this metric tensor has a lot to say with respect to quantum estimation theory but if you try to impose a kind of invariance uh, like the one uh, under uh, sufficient statistics in this case you substitute your class of map with this so-called completely positive and trace preserving maps and if you try to ask what uh, is the metric tensor that you obtain singling out this kind of in this case it's not invariance a kind of, of monotone invariance you find that there is actually an infinite number of such metric tensor so the the fisher out the uniqueness of the fisher out is immediately broken in the quantum case and this is very important it's not that just a mathematical um, non-uniqueness because a lot of these metric tensor do appear in specific information geometric tasks so you cannot rule them out in terms of uh, application because this the one we are interested in um, is very well known in the case of estimation theory but there are others that are used in quantum hypothesis testing uh, some other with the quantum speed limits and they are actually different so different metric different generalization of the fischer rao brings different contributions to the problem so you cannot escape them but one thing is very interesting is that if you take commuting objects then the burel strom metric tensor basically reduces to the fischer rao metric tensor of the on the diagonal operators let's say because all these guys commute so they can be um, simultaneously diagonalized and this is a property shared by all the metric tensor that are, that are monotone invariant with respect to these maps so they are all a kind of genuine generalization 
of this uh, Fisher Rao metric tensor. Oh, I didn't realize this was on, sorry. Okay, so up to now, I hope uh, I was able to convey the idea that to some extent, classical and quantum information geometry, they want to speak to each other. They are really dying for, for interplaying with one another, but they are not uh, able to do it because the mathematical framework is somehow different. However, if you have this feeling, I can tell you that th that is actually a way to, to make them play together in the same playground. And it's given by Jordan algebras. But well, the idea is the following. First, we realize that positive measures can be seen as linear functionals on bounded measurable functions. How? Well, by means of integration. This is definitely to, to each measure you associate a linear function. Very good. But is this just a generic linear function? Well, no. Why no? Because if you take positive element, uh, this linear functional gives you a positive, well, a non-negative number. So this functional uh, respects, so to speak, the positivity of squares here in this um, um, space of bounded measurable functions. Now, this uh, is a vector space, of course, but it's also a real algebra. Indeed, it's a real algebra with respect to uh, the standard associative product, uh, which actually here, <laughs> this is, uh, bad typo, sorry. Uh, this is an algebra which is commutative and associative. Now, a very similar picture can be drawn in the quantum case because we have positive linear operators, and this can be seen as a linear functional on the space of self adjoint operators. How? Well, here we used integration, right? In this quantum case, we use the trace. That's a linear functional, that's easy to see. Uh, what is actually interesting, it's that also these functionals uh, preserve some kind of positivity, in which sense? If you evaluate them on a square of a self-adjoint element, then you get something which is uh, different and uh, which is non-negative. Now, this act of taking the square, which in general you write like this, it's good for um, bounded operator, but for um, self-adjoint operators, it's not quite the correct object that you have to use because the product, the associative product between two linear operators, two self-adjoint linear operators, it's not a self-adjoint linear operators in general. If uh, you are considering the same operators, then yes, of course, this is um, self-adjoint, but in general, it doesn't work. So the self-adjoint, uh, operators are not an algebra with respect to the standard associative product, but they are an algebra with respect to this product, the product associated with the anti-commutator, which is commutative, very much like this one, but it's non-associative. So you might say, okay, where is this going? Well, it is going to the place where we realize that commutative algebras, which can be associative or not, uh, are not so broad. I mean, th there is a subfamily of them known as Jordan algebras, of which these two examples are just particular cases. Because a Jordan algebra is nothing but real algebra with a product that should be commutative, but it's not required to be associative. It has to satisfy this kind of, let me call it power law associativity. Now, I don't want to enter into how people arrived at Jordan algebras in detail, because it's, it's kind of uh, an interesting, but very wide story. Uh, one of the, it all began with some uh, beautiful paper by uh, Wigner, Jordan and von Neumann, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in which they actually classify all finite dimensional formally real one. Uh, and they were based um, on quantum mechanics. So the, the idea was precisely that this anti-commutative product was the one of the key points that you have to abstract from the formalism of quantum mechanics to deal with observables of a physical cube. But um, with respect to this talk, what we need is this algebraic structure and the structure of positive elements that is naturally encoded in this. These are the squares, which can be written also like this. Um, and 
the notion of positive linear functional uh, that depends on this notion of, of squares because then a positive linear functional on a Jordan algebra will be an element of the dual such that it takes no negative value on squares of the algebra. And well, the prototypical examples are this one. So essentially bounded function on a measure space. And this is the classical case. And uh, bear in mind, this works also in infinite dimensions. So when omega is not discrete, but in that case, you might want to add some, um, how to say, some analytical condition. So you want a norm somewhere to appear in order to, to get reasonable topologies. Then you have the algebra of bounded self-adjoint self operators, which is the quantum case. And also these works when H is infinite dimensional, but also in that case, if you really want uh, to do things involving geometry, you need to control the topology at some point. So you need some additional assumptions. So Jordan algebras are not enough. You would need something like Jordan Hilbert algebras or Jordan Banach algebras, something that luckily for the moment we are not interested in. I mean, I am interested in them, but not for the purpose of, of this talk. And the last one, it's kind of a nice uh, thing because it's called uh, spin factor. It's definitely different than these two. And recently it has been connected with the theory of color perception. That's the work by Eduardo Provenzi and Michel Berthier. It's a very cool um, uh, approach to color perception theory that builds a lot on the quantum case. So they try because basically Jordan algebras appear in, in quantum case and because somehow in color perception theory, um, thanks to a very interesting work by Resnikov in the 70s, um, it's possible to make Jordan algebras appear. They are building a kind of dictionary that translates quantum concept into concept of color perception theory. That kind of works. So it's if you if it happens that you come across these papers, uh, give them a look because they are incredibly fascinating. And they show how this uh, Jordan algebra uh, framework seems to be quite quite general. So Florio, I never hear about the color perception theory. So of course you explain a little bit, but the, that is not quantum theory and also not. Uh... No, that's not quantum theory. Basically the idea is what is the geometry of the RGB space, red, green, and blue space? When we perceive colors, we basically um, stimulate some kind of, of, of uh, brain cell and uh, cells in, in, the, in, the, in the eyes. And uh, also, is, what is a phys physiology theory? Yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And the main assumption is that the correct uh, geometrical structure to. Yeah, also, so, so I, I know there are many people working on it. Also, uh, Dmitry Alisevsky and. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's a very fascinating subject. And yeah, okay. the connection with Jordan algebras is kind of surprising. And oh, yes. Yeah, so, people... uh, Dmitry Alisevsky also uh, know a lot of this stuff. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know these guys. I'm actually referring to Provenzi. Provenzi. And Berthier. They are uh, explicitly working on color perception theory from the point of view of Jordan algebras and a parallel with the quantum case. But unfortunately, I will not uh, be um, telling much about this. Um, so th th that was just a, to, to mention it. Now we are about to start, so to speak, the, the actual part of, of the seminar that concerns what we did, because I forgot to say this is a, um, a joint work and actually a work in progress with Jürgen Jost and Lorenz Schwachhofer. Uh, we have a lot of other things, but um, this is uh, what at the moment uh, I've already submitted as, as a preprint and to a journal. So uh, some technical assumption that we need to make all the geometry, the, all the geometrical picture very neat, because in infinite dimension, you will see why it's not as, as neat that first, we consider finite dimensional algebras. And second, we need this formally real algebra, meaning that if the sum of squares is zero, then the squares must be zero. That's, that seems trivial, but it's not always the case. Now, what happens in this case? It happens that the positive linear functionals, which remember, they generalize at the same time uh, probability distribution actually unnormalized probability distribution with unnormalized quantum states. 
this guy, which I uh, define like this, is actually partitioned into the disjoint union of manifold, which are orbits of some group, which in a moment we will define. So you immediately see that you have a natural partition of your space into models that are somehow maximal in the sense that you cannot extend this manifold structure further. And also these manifold structures are actually orbits of some Lie group, which is, I think, a kind of very nice uh, situation that you encounter. Now, who is this group? This is called the, the structure group of the, of the Jordan algebra. So it's really connected with the Jordan algebra um, uh, case. And it's defined like this. We first consider what this map which is a linear map from j to j and it's actually the left representation of the algebra in itself in this case since the algebra is commutative left and right makes no real difference but let's call it left now then you can prove that's actually a standard uh, proof in, in jordan theory jordan algebra theory that if you take the commutator of these two linear maps uh, you obtain something which is a derivation of the jordan product and moreover if you take the commutator of this type of derivations, then you still get a derivation of the same type. So the type of derivation generated by this uh, left action of the algebra in itself is actually a, a least subalgebra of uh, the algebra of derivations. And then once you know here, you introduce the structure group. That's a very loose introduction. So there are more sophisticated and well uh, conceived way to introduce the structure group that actually work better um, when we pass to the infinite dimensional case but they require definitely more work <laughs> to be to be given so that's why i'm using this kind of shortcut so uh, for us here the structure group will be the lie group generated by this lie algebra you see the the commutator of this is an element of this type and uh, commutator between elements of this type is still an element of this type so we actually have the lie algebra then the Lie group that we generate acts on the algebra, as you can see here. Now I decided to, to write down uh, how the exponential of an element here acts just mm, for concreteness. You can actually compute it. Well, in finite dimension, this always works and there is no problem, but then since remember positive linear functionals are element in the dual of the algebra then uh, well we need the dual of this action in order to obtain the decomposition that uh, i told you before and now perhaps some of you who are um, um, familiar with kirillov theory are starting to understand where are we going because in kirillov's theory you have a lie algebra um, you have a lie group actually a lie algebra and an action of the Lie group on the dual of the Lie algebra. Here we have a Lie group, an algebra, a dual of an algebra, and an action of the Lie group on the algebra. The problem is that J is not the Lie algebra of this group, but we can manage. I hope I will be able to convince you that we can manage. Now, there are two examples of this type of, of, of uh, orbits that we can discuss, which are basically the examples that we just uh, considered. So in this case, we have the Jordan algebra Rn, which is just the Jordan algebra of this um, essentially bounded function on this space. That's a very fancy way of writing it, but uh, the Jordan product is just pointwise multiplication. And you see here, element in J, I write them as uh, row vectors, but since we are in finite dimension, J can be definitely identified with uh, dual. And to make, things clearer i will write element in j star uh, as uh, column vectors so that's why i'm writing the multiplication like this now since the algebra basically so is associative and that's the only type of uh, associative jordan algebras in finite dimension then the commutator between these two guys immediately seem to be zero what does it mean well it means that the derivation part actually plays no role and the structure group in this case is just just the exponential of j 
I, I'm writing it uh, among quotes because uh, that's not the exponential that one would expect in Lie algebras because, uh, well, this is not a Lie algebra. The point is that uh, an element in the group can be written like this, as you can see, its components are all strictly positive numbers. So that the action on element of the algebra is this, which is immediately uh, translated into this kind of, of vertical action on the dual. And you see that if P1, Pn is greater or equal to zero, then also it's transformed is greater or equal than zero. And actually, if Pj is different from zero, then also it's transformed. And you can easily prove that the, the vice versa also holds. So the orbits of these guys, let's say uh, in, in, in 2D, just for concreteness, are the full, uh, upper um, right corner, then these manifold without the origin, these other things. Here we are taking uh, P1 equal to zero and here P2 equal to zero. And then we have the trivial manifold, which is just a zero, which is, well, it's, we, we add it because we don't want to, to, to leave it alone. Okay, well, if we try to do the same construction in the quantum case, so when the algebra the J is now the algebra of self adjoint operators with respect to the anti commutator product. And again, we fix uh, the dimension of H to be smaller than infinity because we don't want to enter immediately in technical problems. Then what we can do is compute this um, commutator between these maps and you realize it that it's actually defined in terms of, I know too many square brackets. I know I should have used another notation, but I was not able to come up with uh, a good one. So I've plugged in a little minus here to denote what? To denote this kind of commutator map, which however, see, it has a little i here. Why? Because then we can take self-adjoint elements and still get an overall self adjoint element. If I don't put the i here, then, well, you cannot obtain a self adjoint element. But this is important to get self adjoint elements because basically then uh, you can describe this type of derivation in terms of one element which is self adjoint. So that the action of an element in the Lie algebra of the structure group can really be written in terms of the action of this guy. A well plus or minus depends on your on your um, taste, which is an element where well this is a generic element in the algebra of bounded operators. So you conclude that the structure group is the exponential of the bounded operators, which now it's a true exponential because this is a Lie algebra with respect to the commutator. So that the structure group in this specific case is just the general linear group. And what are the orbits? I seem not to be able to use this object. No. I told you I was rusty. So what is the action now? Now the action uh, turns out to be this one, that where G is the, the well, let's say the matrix exponential, the operator exponential of A plus IB. You see, there is a dagger here where I'm, I'm denoting the adjoint in the uh, sense of uh, the theory of bounded operators. So, and, so, two moment. So uh, you have G equal the exponential of A plus uh, IB yeah. over two. Yes. So what is the AB here? I go to remind. Yes, A and B are both self-adjoint operators. So I can, I can write it also like this, for instance, A over X, where this guy is just a bounded operator. Uh, but uh, in this way, I decompose it in terms of its self-adjoint and anti-self-adjoint part. Because, yeah. so, so wait, 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 wait. We have to build the algebra, which is uh, the algebra of the left uh, action and the one that we find using the commutator. Mm -hmm. Now, in the case, so when, when the algebra is the Jordan algebra of bounded operators, now the, this part here accounts for a self adjoint operator, right? 
Then we have to take the commutator of these guys. Now the commutator of these guys turns out to be basically because, uh, well, of, of the property of this space that can be written. So the, the commutator of LX with LY acting on C is just a linear map, which is the commutator of what? Of a commutator with C. So it's kind of evoluted, I understand. But the point is that uh, this commutator transforms into a kind of double commutator here. But double commutator, which is expressed in terms of elements, which are again in B of SA. So then uh, you can use them to introduce this B guy and basically see that uh, instead of giving the uh, action in terms of these two things, you can give it in terms of this A plus IB, which are elements uh, which are completely free to, to ro roam inside the self adjoint elements. So A plus IB is just an element here in, in B of H, so the algebra of, of self adjoint operators, because every self adjoint operator, uh, sorry, uh, the algebra of bounded linear operators, because every bounded linear operator can be written as the sum of its self-adjoint and anti-self-adjoint part. So that's the I plus IB that appears here in the exponential uh, and which gives rise basically to, to this action here, which has the adjoint basically because it has to preserve self-adjointness. Remember that J is uh, the space of self-adjoint elements. This is an action of J. So the result must be self-adjoint. And the dual, well, the dual basically is uh, with the exchange of uh, G Daga, the, the place of G and G Daga. Uh, if you're familiar with some kind of formulation of, of quantum theory, this would be kind of the Eisenberg perspective. And here you would get the kind of, let's say Schrodinger-like perspective. But if you're not familiar, that there's no problem. It's not really meaningful in this in this context. What is important is that this um, action do preserve positivity, and uh, if your sp your state is actually invertible, so it's um, strictly positive, then an orbit through it is the whole space. To prove it, you can basically. Uh, decompose rho in uh, according to its spectral decomposition, um, where these guys are projectors. And then you can use suitable unitaries to, to actually show that uh, this um, orbit is the whole space of a strictly positive operator. So one of the uh, manifold that we found uh, before. Okay. But up to now, we just get what? We get a very uh, naked structure because we just have our manifolds, our parametric manifolds. There is no geometric structure there, but we know that classical and quantum information geometry, they are uh, enriched with, with the metric structure. So we have the fischer metric tensor and among many, the Burelstrom metric tensor in the quantum case. So, how can we actually uh, obtain them? Is it possible to use some kind of algebraic structures in the, um, the Jordan algebra case to obtain some geometric structures? Where uh, this type of, of procedure, so to speak, is at the heart of Kirillov theory, because Kirillov theory takes the algebraic structure of a Lie algebra and turns it into geometrical structure on the dual. And imagine that here we have J and here we have its dual. So there seems to be kind of, of a point of contact between the two things. So let's try to, let's try to remember in a very broad uh, sense and rough way uh, what this Kirillov theory is. Uh, we start with the Lie group, with the Lie algebra G, we select a basis in the algebra and we build the structure constant. These are, of course, associated with the specific choice of basis. Uh, but once we have it, we introduce the associated Cartesian coordinates on the dual, and we can define this tensor here. Now, I understand that this is not a very elegant way to introduce this tensor. I, I agree. 
uh, it uses coordinates and the structure constant. Uh, that there are more um, elaborated ways, but I, I think that it makes no sense to, to, to go into this higher abstraction for what we want to do. So this is really a down-to-earth approach where you can see the face of this tensor. And you can see that this tensor is particular because somehow it's linear. Okay. Now... Uh, yes, uh, actually that's not only uh, giving low right? as it's uh, also name of the Sure. Uh, of... Yes, 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 yes. In fact, and, the, the, and that is basically is you call the function tensor because uh, it's um, collated on the symplectic. Uh, yeah, yeah. I I want precisely to go there. So the, the the final object that we will find, oops, which is here, it's actually the KKS symplectic form, which is actually the constant Kirillov Suryo symplectic form because. Well, Kirillov sometimes uh, takes uh, all the credit, but this is, was actually a, a work done by, by many people. So you're right. It's, it's not completely uh, fair to call it just Kirillov's theory or just uh, not mentioning the other. That's true. So here we have this tensor, this tensor here, which becomes uh, definitely it's anti-symmetric. Uh, but since these are the structure constant of Ali algebra, this object becomes a Poisson tensor. So it satisfies some uh, uh, more geometrical properties. So that's how the interplay between algebraic structure and geometric structures starts. Okay, but that's not the end of the story because well, realize, we realize that to any element in the algebra, we can associate a linear function on the dual space. That's kind of trivial, it's just, very abstractly speaking, the immersion of a vector space into its double dual. Okay. What is important, however, is that uh, with this type of function, we can basically build a distribution at the point Xi. So Xi is in the dual of the algebra, and this is a subspace of the tangent space at Xi. Very good which is obtained how? Well, you take the Poisson tensor and you contract it with the linear function and you evaluate the result at xi. This is a tangent vector associated with this. Now, since basically linear function generate the, the cotangent space at each point, well, this is, it seems not general, but it's, it's really general. And you can consider the union of this distribution for xi varying into G star. This is actually the Poisson distribution associated with the Poisson tensor. And something quite interesting happens here at each of these uh, dx i spaces. Because in terms of, again, the Lie structure, we can define what? Something which takes two elements, you see here, and gives you this object here, which is linear in xi, so to speak. And it's definitely anti-symmetric. And this is in fact a symplectic bilinear form because we are living only on a vector space. It's not actually a symplectic form yet, which is known as the constant kirillov suryo symplectic uh, bilinear form. Now, what happens up to now has nothing to do with the Lie algebra. I mean, we can substitute instead of a Lie algebra, a lot of other type of algebras and all this picture that I wrote here basically stays the same. What actually changes is that we no longer have a Poisson tensor. Uh, this guy may be symmetric, anti-symmetric or nothing. So that uh, this is no longer a symplectic bilinear form. So up to now, what Kirillov constant Sugo did is actually more general. Where the, the assumption of Lie algebra comes really into place here now, when uh, we have this distribution here and we want to find if it's integrable or not. Well, in the case of Lie algebras, uh, yes, it's always integrable. Uh, basically because uh, we have the so-called Hamiltonian vector fields and they, they give a representation of this Lie algebra here. Now that is where the assumption of working with the Lie algebra is crucial. Uh, so we can always, given Xi, we can always find a maximal leaf through it. And this maximal leaf happens to be what? Happens to be the orbit through Xi of what? Of the quadjoint action. So the dual of the adjoint action of the Lie group on its 
uh, Lie algebra. And then everything works well together because the symplectic bilinear forms that I told you before actually glue up in a very smooth way and they give a symplectic form on each of these orbits, on each of these leaves. But it's only now that the, the, um, the structure of Lie algebra really comes into place. Now, why we were struck by this thing? Because, well, in the Jordan algebra case, you basically have everything except this integrability. But uh, what is more relevant, I think, is that here, well, I, we will see it now, we get something that it's not anti-symmetric, but it's symmetric because we adapt this theory like this. We select the basis in the, in the Jordan algebra, we write the structure constant, and we build the tensor, which we call R now. So now these DJKL are the structure constants of what? Of the Jordan algebra, which is abelian. So this tensor is actually symmetric and, in, and it's already calling for, you know, there is a metric somewhere here, perhaps pseudo Riemannian. And well, the tensor acts like this. So we can do everything that we did before. We can introduce the, the equivalent of the, the XIG, but now with, with J, these are just these um, vector subspaces of the dual uh, of the tangent space, which are obtained by contraction of, of the tensor that we have with these covectors. Uh, we obtain what we call the Jordan distributions. And this Jordan distribution is generated by these vector fields, which are just this linear vector field here. These are the Jordan counterpart of the Hamiltonian uh, vector field in, uh, in the Kirillov theory, in the Lie algebra case. But the point is that now the commutator of these vector fields is no longer uh, closed. I mean, you don't get the same type of vector field because, well, because it's not a Lie algebra, that's a Jordan algebra. But this is a point that we will uh, investigate in a second, because what we immediately realize is that instead of uh, the omega form, so the symplectic bilinear form that we saw before, here we have some kind of bilinear and symmetric form, because clearly the Jordan algebra is, is symmetric. And you see also what that you get uh, if this is evaluated on the same object, you have this. Now, if Xi is actually, is actually a positive linear function, or you know that this guy should be always greater equal than zero. So somehow the, the fact that this kind of procedure will lead us to obtain a Riemannian metric tensor on the manifolds of positive linear functions seems more and more reasonable, at least I hope. Well, something that you can do, but since I'm definitely running out of time, we will not uh, discuss too much is that um, this type of, of object has a very nice uh, invariance property because it's invariant with respect to the automorphism of the Jordan algebra. Uh, this is not, so this is contained in the group GJ. That's very important. So the result will be something that it's invariant, not under the group for which our manifold is, uh, uh, is an orbit, so an homogeneous space, but for a subgroup which uh, in the quantum case is just a unitary group. Okay. Now, as I mentioned before, the distribution is not integrable because the commutator of this guy, uh, since uh, they are related with the, the left uh, representation of the algebra in itself is this type of derivation. So that's not in general um, true that the, the distribution is integrable. What is the condition of integrability? Well, when the span of this type of objects is the same as the span of the left action. But uh, what does it mean uh, concretely? Well, in this case, uh, it means that the span of what? Of the type of Lx plus dAb, that's basically the same uh, as the span of the Lx, because the, the contribution of the derivation when this is true, basically is, um, is, is redundant. And this span is precisely the tangent space at Xi of the orbit generated by the group action. So the point is that 
there is there is no Lie group. Well, actually, there is no Lie algebra associated with the Lie group that we are uh, dealing with. But there is the Lie group. It's the structure group. But we are not interested in Lie algebra directly, only in a very indirect way, because integrability is yet uh, is still uh, defined in terms of, of of this Lie algebra of the general linear of this structure group, but only when it coincides with the span of uh, the left fraction of the Jordan algebra itself. So there is a kind of compatibility condition between the span of the left action of the Jordan algebra and the span of, of the, the Ali algebra of the structure group that brings in integrability. And thus, if this is uh, possible, of course, this depends on the point xi. Well, we also have the leaves, which, because of this condition here, are just the orbit of the group. Now, I don't want to enter into details. Uh, that there is actually the, the paper on the archive, so you can consult it for all the details. And also, it's written definitely better than how I am explaining. Uh, the, the, all the details are there. Um, and of course, if you want to ask me something, um, you can write to me. I'm always very happy to discuss these things. But the point is that you can prove that the condition that I mentioned, for sure, it's satisfied when your point or minus is actually a positive linear function. You see this overall minus really doesn't change anything. You can deal with positive linear function or negative linear function. They basically are the same thing up to an overall minus sign, which really plays no role. And uh, thus the object that we discussed before, it glues together. It's something that you also prove, giving you what? Giving you um, a covariant uh, tensor, which is symmetric, it's invertible also, and it's positive if you consider positive linear function, of course. So basically, it is a Riemannian metric on the orbit through psi. Uh, however, there are points in general for a generic algebra, there are points at which this con condition is, is violated. So uh, you don't have the Jordan analog of the symplectic foliation because there are points at which the leaves basically, they, they don't exist. But luckily for the manifolds uh, of interest in, in information geometry, both classical and quantum, these leaves do exist. And the analog of the constant kirillov -Sim uh, surio symplectic form is this uh, Riemannian metric. Who is this Riemannian metric? Well, I think you can safely guess that when the algebra is Rn, uh, we, you can do everything, and the result is nothing but the fischer rao metric tensor. This follows because, well, in this case, it's trivial, the integrability condition, because the vector fields commute. So this condition is actually true for all psi. But that's a very, very peculiar case. The orbits uh, we just uh, saw are like this. The vector fields are like this. So we can really write down who is this guy. Uh, it's just what you find here, that if you compare, basically, sorry for the switching, to what is written here, you basically obtain the fischer rao metric tensor. Where is it? Yeah. Okay. Ah, the, this was one over. <laughs> of course, I was, uh, it was not. Okay, for you. No, no, sorry. This is this is okay. You you then inquire that this is the case because here the vector field is linear of this type. So to get a linear factor here, the the tensor should be uh, should have one over x uh, as its component. Now the proof that in the self adjoint case, so when the algebra is the algebra self adjoint elements. Um, for a finite uh, dimension inverse space, uh, you obtain the burel metric tensor is slightly less, uh, so to speak, um, ele not, not elegant, but slightly less immediate because you have to first understand who this guy is. If you remember, this is related with the anti commutator, but then uh, you say, what? Wait, 
uh, if rho is actually uh, strictly positive, I can introduce this linear operator, which is basically the operator that gives me the anti-commutator with respect to rho. But since rho is positive, this operator is invertible. So, well, uh, I can take its inverse. And then uh, you can write uh, this in terms of a commutator, uh, sorry, an anti-commutator and its inverse. That is why. So I'm applying the identity operator here and I'm writing it as uh, A times uh, its, um, its inverse. So it's, it's slightly convoluted, but it tells you that at each point you can define this vector and the commutator of two of these gradient type vector fields is just of the same type. But you see this element C of rho, it depends on each rho. So this is not a, a global uh, decomposition, but still you can show that pointwise this condition is fulfilled. And well, when you compute the Burel's strong metric tensor, uh, you find that it's actually the tensor that we uh, obtain with this uh, Kirillov quadrant uh, method. How? Well, an element in the tangent space, V rho, can also be written like this for what we just saw. So A turns out to be what? Since this guy can be written as A rho applied to A, uh, we can write A as um, A rho to the minus one applied to this. So we apply A rho to the minus one on this and we obtain this relation, which of course works also in this case. And then, well, then we are done because we remember how the Burel strom metric tensor is, is defined. It's this expression. As I told you, this follows from, uh, well, uh, other consideration people uh, found it when, when dealing with quantum metrology. Uh, and it has to do with the so-called uh, symmetric logarithmic derivative, which is another way to write basically this uh, inverse operator. Uh, so instead of this a rho to the minus one of w of rho, we get just b. And then since we remember that b of rho can be written how as the anti-commutator of rho with a, we obtain this equality, then we exploit the cyclicity of the trace. And this is nothing but the object that we define on our orbit when we emulate, so to speak, the Kirillov theory. So we found what? That the Burel strometric tensor is nothing but the Jordan algebraic analog of the constant Kirillov sort of uh, form when the Jordan algebra is uh, B of SA of H. So that's basically the end. Thank you for staying with me up to now. What, what is that I would like you to bring home? Basically two things that the parametric models of positive linear functional on Jordan algebra uh, are, are a good way to deal with classical and quantum geometry, information geometry in the same mathematical framework. This could help understanding uh, similarities and differences, of course. And it brings some kind of unifying feature that perhaps I hope you, you appreciate. And then that this framework is somehow perfect to show that by adapting Kirillov's theory, we can actually extract geometrical structure from the algebraic uh, ones in the case uh, related with the Jordan algebra structure. And what happens is that we obtain the Fischerometric tensor and the burel strometric tensor as different uh, faces of the same Jordan algebraic cone. And this brings again a unifying picture to this Riemannian aspect of um, classical and quantum information geometry. Uh, of course, there are, as I said, other metric tensors uh, that are used in quantum information geometry that are not captured by this picture, but that's perfectly fine. Uh, what I would like to stress is that the burel strom metric tensor uh, really as a counterpart, uh, really should be thought as the counterpart of the constant Kirillov symplectic form. So I'm not claiming that this makes it more important than the other. I'm just saying that from the geometrical point of view, this is an equivalent way to, um, to discuss it. And if you do like this, then the Burelstrom and the Fischerometric tensor really are basically two phases of the same cone. And well, with, with this, I, I finish, I stop. I should be just three minutes late. And well, I thank you for, for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Gloria, for your 
a beautiful and a really unexpected the result. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so first I uh, ask a question. You say that unifies a fission round metric, but of course that's only on finite uh, sample space because, right? Yeah. But uh, 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 when you talk to people working statistics, they say that they use mostly the Gaussian distribution on the probability. I and, agree. Uh, and then, of course, the next thing to see that, uh, of course, you can not uh, see a lot of condition to define Fisher round metric, but the very natural way is to look at it, Gaussian distribution, or you did not try. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The I, sorry, I'm a little trouble. Where is the problem? Okay. You see the problem to pass to the infinite dimensional case basically lies here. Uh, you, you, you only uh, the text, uh, how to say, finite dimension and uh, chalk down algebra. No, 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 no. To, to deal with Gaussian, you need this Jordan algebra. Basically need this algebra here. Where mu is still a bag measure. Uh, uh, yeah. So, and this is uh, definitely not finite dimension. Mm -hmm. That's infinitely dimension. Uh, so, to, de to, to properly deal with Jordan algebras, uh, the two with Gaussians, the parametric, that's, that's a weird thing that unfortunately happens. The parametric manifold is finite dimensional. So, you see, if we, if we yes. from the beginning, yeah, sure. that's, I say, this guy, those are families of finite dimensional. But these, no, that's the point. So the Jordan algebra that we need is not finite dimensional. And when you have an, an infinite dimensional Jordan algebra and you try to do this construction, you hit the wall here. Because these um, uh, spaces that build up the Jordan distribution, that it's at the heart of everything, they are in general not closed. Even if they are closed, they are not complemented in general. Mm -hmm. So this brings a huge uh, difficulties. And the case of Gaussian, believe it or not, is the, the worst case scenario. Because in, in some cases, you can have that these guys are actually closed and complemented. Uh, in the, the case of Gaussian, no. Um, you perhaps you wish okay perhaps they are close no they are not even close so this whole picture seems to break down uh, unless you well you invent something different so in another uh, work again with with Jürgen and Lawrence but also with another student of Jürgen's uh, Fabio uh, we actually were able to consider this framework so uh, of models uh, in, in also in the infinite dimensional case, but we had to use two different things. We didn't use Jordan algebras. We used W star algebras. Uh, these are basically C star algebras with additional properties. So the first thing that we, we need to leave the real case and go to the complex one for some kind of, of, yeah. of technical conditions. And unfortunately, you don't get this object here. Oh, where is it? You don't get R. You don't get the full geometric picture of it, but you still, even in this infinite dimensional case, define uh, basically this object here. Where is it? This. Uh, then you have to carefully complete it in a very functional analytic way. And then you can deal with Gaussian. There is no problem. But unfortunately, to do this, you have to leave this um, geometric Kirillov-like Kirillov picture. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope that we are able to recover everything when we consider Jordan-Hilbert algebras. Uh, and we, we somehow think that uh, we could get the Gaussians at least and some other well-known distribution in that case. Uh, because working with Jordan Hilbert algebras means working with Jordan algebras that basically are also Hilbert spaces, and which will mean to deal with something like L2. I'm not saying that L2 is an algebra, so that's why I'm on quotes, but to give you just a, a kind of flavor. Uh, and in this case, basically differential geometry in finite dimension and infinite dimension are very much uh, the same.
again, among quotes, but still it's not as wild as the other case. Yes. So is there more question? Okay, if there are no more questions,